Welcome to this opening session of Climate Breakthroughs, The Road to COP26 and Beyond. My name is Antonia Gavel, Head of Climate Action at the World Economic Forum, and it's my pleasure to host this discussion today. We have six months to go before COP26. It's a highly anticipated moment where leaders will gather to get the world on track to deliver the 2015 Paris Climate Agreement. Now, our window for making the necessary commitments, investments, and actions to deliver a global net zero economy before 2050 is rapidly closing, which is why the COP milestone this year is so critical. On a positive note, momentum has been building with more and more countries and companies setting Paris aligned commitments, but collectively, we're not there yet. So as a collaboration between the Forum, the UK COP26 Presidency, the UNFCCC High Level Climate Champions, and the Mission Possible Partnership, we're gathering here today to really focus on three things. So number one, what system transformations are needed to get us on track? Number two, where are we on that journey today? And finally, and I think most importantly, what specific actions can we drive over the next six months to land the desired outcome in Glasgow. So let me just emphasize the first point for a minute. So tackling climate change, as we know, is truly a whole system transformation. This discussion comes on the back of a two-day virtual ocean dialogue where we had over 200,000 people dialing in to highlight the importance of oceans for resilience, livelihoods, but also in tackling climate change. Today, we'll also dive into a series of discussions on industry systems transformation. Energy, of course, with Fatih here this morning, but also shipping hydrogen steel as just a few of the critical hard to abate sectors. And equally, we have to harness the power of nature in delivering a sustainable net zero future. This requires a shift in land use and drastic emission reductions from food and agricultural sectors. So, of course, I think we know that achieving this won't happen quickly if policymakers, business, investors, societal actors are waiting for others to lead. The time for that is gone. We need all actors to step up in parallel, recognizing the connected role that all our natural systems, our economic systems, and our societal systems can play. We also come to these discussions amidst a particularly challenged context with an ongoing global pandemic. Lives are still being lost every day to the health crisis, but also to extreme poverty, which as we know has increased for the first time in 22 years. So we have an incredible opportunity, but also I think I would call it a global obligation to emerge from this pandemic with climate and people positive solutions. So I think we can look forward um, and, and get mobilized behind this positive momentum that's been building to move forward uh, towards COP. So with that, let's get started. Uh, to get us going, we have a short video message from Alec Sharma, the president designate for COP26. Good morning, it's a pleasure to join you today. Friends, we're all aware of the facts. The time we have left to keep the goals of the Paris Agreement within reach is diminishing, fast. If we're to keep the 1.5 degree limit alive, we must halve global emissions by 2030 and reach net zero emissions by the middle of the century. And this requires rapid action across the real economy. So it's really fantastic to see the momentum building throughout the whole of the corporate sector. Today, we have well over 2,000 companies and 130 investors signed up to the Race to Zero campaign. This is the gold standard of climate action pioneered by my friends Nigel Topping and Gonzalo Munoz that requires both a net zero commitment and short-term targets based on the science to get there. Companies can increasingly see the benefits of joining Race to Zero for the planet and their bottom line and membership sends a clear message to investors and customers. And it can also boost innovation and save money as firms strive to reduce emissions. We're also seeing progress across the race to zero breakthroughs. To keep the 1.5 degree target alive, we need more than action 
from individual companies. We need rapid change gathering force across entire sectors. And that requires a critical mass moving to clean ways of working in each sector. And key actors working together towards a shared goal so that the transition takes on a momentum of its own. This is what Race to Zero Breakthroughs seeks to achieve. So it is very encouraging to see real progress in vital sectors such as steel, shipping and across nature. Mesk, the world's largest shipping company, has committed to the Race to Zero, as have major food industry players such as Walmart and Sainsbury's. And with industry giants like these on board, we are much closer to reaching the critical mass we need to transform steel, shipping and food and agriculture industries. And I urge all companies that have not already done so to join the Race to Zero campaign and to commit your skills, your innovation and resources to help deliver the Race to Zero breakthroughs. To those of you that have already joined these initiatives, thank you. And now, please encourage your peers to do exactly the same as you. Because with all of us on board, we can create the change we need across the global economy. So let's work together to make COP26 the moment we put the world on a path to a resilient, net zero future and keep 1.5 degrees alive. Thank you. So thank you to Alec for that important message. And as we've heard, momentum is building in this race to zero. So let's dive straight in. Um, we have a great panel with us today. And really, again, the focus is where are we and what needs to happen over the next six months. Um, so let me welcome these leaders. We have Fatih Birol, Executive Director of the International Energy Agency, joining us this morning. Sheila Patel is the Global Ambassador for the Race to Zero, um, will be joining us. She's just having a little bit of trouble dialing in, but we'll get there. Uh, Jesper Broden, CEO of Inca Group, IKEA, and finally, Fika Sebesma, Honorary Chairman of DSM. So Fatih, we're going to start with you. Um, of course, as a former IEA colleague, I was particularly happy uh, to see the report that was launched last week, uh, which for the first time really sets out a true decarbonization pathway for the energy sector to hit net zero by 2050. It, of course, lays out some pretty bold actions that are required. So just in a few minutes, I know the analysis runs deep. We'd love to just hear some of the highlights from you but also, what do you see as kind of the gap between what you're saying and what needs to happen with a focus on, on how we can push that forward over the next six months? So, Fatih, over to you. Thank you, uh, Antonia. It is good to see former IEA colleagues uh, uh, taking such uh, nice, uh, good jobs around the world. So, very uh, uh, good. And uh, I I believe you are one of our ambassadors now at, with the WEF, i.e. ambassador at uh, WEF. Very nice to see you again. Now, uh, you just uh, mentioned uh, several uh, countries around the world uh, come up with a net zero uh, pledge. This is uh, very good. But uh, what we thought is that having this pledge 2050 is good, but it is important to translate those emission uh, pledges to what needs to happen in the energy sector. There's a translation, because the pledge alone wouldn't uh, be uh, convincing enough for the markets, for the investors, and most importantly, for the uh, citizens. So when we look at the, uh, the numbers, how the energy sector, global energy sector, needs to transform itself to reach that target, we see a narrow, a very narrow pathway, but still achievable. And uh, to do that, uh, one key issue is, of course, international uh, collaboration here. You mentioned in the beginning, uh, it's a race to zero. Race to zero, but it is important to understand that the race is not between the nations, but the race is against the time. And we should also acknowledge that some governments, some countries are starting this race in front of the others. 
and therefore it is very important uh, that the especially those richer countries should support the efforts of uh, uh, the uh, developing nations to finish the race uh, together and looking at the global nature of the uh, our climate challenge i believe unless everybody finishes the race nobody wins that uh, race so it is very important that there's international collaboration uh, here now in our report uh, there are many things but i wanted to highlight the task we have in front of us three major tasks number one especially in the next 10 years make the most out of the existing clean energy options which are in the market today what are those solar wind energy efficiency electric cars a big 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 expansion of those available technologies in hand or options second simultaneously at the same time we have to push the button for the technologies which are under development today but not yet a, a part of the market such as many hydrogen applications advanced battery technologies carbon capture and storage many different uh, technologies so we will need them especially for those areas where it is it is much more difficult than the power sector to de decarbonize it, such as iron steel such as uh, aviation such as shipping uh, and the others so this is the second job the first one is make the most out of the existing ones clean energy options second push the button for innovation to bring new technologies to the market and the third and the last one we have to reduce the use of fossil fuels in a dramatic way coal oil and gas so these are the three major uh, homeworks tasks we have in front of us we also uh, uh, look at this uh, the how will it happen the key issue magic word is investments we have to see a huge jump on uh, investments today global energy investments today in the world coal oil efficiency uh, renewables electricity everything is today about two trillion in order to make this jump global energy investments need to go to 5 trillion in 10 years of time so big increase in the investments but not only that today's energy investments are dominated by fossil fuel investments out of this 5 trillion it should be a basically clean energy investments we work with the IMF special uh, project in this report what is the implication for the economy it's a good thing or a bad thing for the economy what we found out working with our colleagues with the imf is that this surge in investments leads to each year 0.4 percentage point additional growth in global economy so this is definitely a good uh, uh, news so i would like to finish by uh, saying uh, that the in order to make sure that the governments have a roadmap citizens industry we came up with over 400 milestones between now and 2050 what needs to uh, be done and when what and when to, a, a time uh, timeline just to give you a couple of examples to, to a, a flavor of it Fatih, let, me, let me just jump in briefly if i may um just to keep keep the cadence up here obviously 400 is a lot um it would be great i would love to kind of hear what are your sort of top 
two most important actions really to get. I was about to say three of them. Yeah, One is the uh, 2035. 60 percent of the all car sales should be electric cars. So today, five percent, it goes to uh, 60 percent. Second, 2040, half of the aviation fuels should be synthetic fuels or biofuels. And number three, as a result of the declining demand of oil, as of this year, no more need for new oil and gas and coal investments. So these are three uh, milestones we have uh, presented in our uh, report in addition to other uh, 400 uh, uh, milestones. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Fatih. And I think the, the points that you raised in that report have certainly made waves in terms of, in particular, where we channel investments um, in clean technologies and moving out of some of those technologies that are, are presenting obvious challenges for climate abatement. I think just one, one quick follow-up question for you that I wanted to jump in around is um, some of the uncertainties that you highlight. You highlight in the report three key uncertainties. One, CCS, two, bioenergy, and of course, three, behavioral change. Now, things like CCS have been highlighted as a critical part of achieving climate mitigation in, in scenarios for a long time. We haven't actually mobilized the investments that have been called for to date. And similarly, when it comes to bioenergy, we talked about that whole system approach to climate mitigation, which of course requires a balance in terms of nature, uh, nature's contribution and, and land use. Can you just really briefly give us a sense of, of how we need to think about these uncertainties to make sure that things go in the right direction um, and really how we push over the next six months to, to drive investments in the right place and in just kind of a quick closing reflection? Uh, CCS, in my view, CCS, we like it or not, it is a critical technology if we were to reach our uh, climate targets. And it is still not there where, we, where it needs to be, but I am hopeful because there's a momentum coming now very strongly from United States, Canada, UK, Norway, and, and the others with strong incentives. And I, I have high expectations from the new US administration. In addition to 45Q, there will be other incentives coming. For bioenergy, uh, the, uh, in our report, uh, we look at what is the sustainability limit of uh, bioenergy to make the most out of it, but it shouldn't be, bioenergy option shouldn't be abused not to have impact on uh, the, uh, the, uh, the rather fragile equilibrium of our planet. So we were very careful on that. But to finish closing remark, for me, the biggest uncertainty is what will come out in COP26. And it is the reason uh, we have prepared this uh, roadmap to make the governments accountable to the pledges they made. And I think this is what we are going to do every year. We are going to uh, look whether or not governments are on track or off track vis-a-vis -vis their pledges. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Fatih, and, and thank you for, for that overview, as well as the work that you've done um, at the IEA, and we, we look forward to kind of things to come in the lead up to COP as well. Um, let me now turn to Sheila, uh, Sheila Patel, who is the director for the Society for the Promotion of Area Resource Centers, but also the global ambassador for the Race to Resilience, which is a sister campaign to the Race to Zero. Um, firstly, we want to send our best wishes, given the situation in India, um, recognize that it continues to be challenging, and, and really appreciate you joining us here today. Um, so we'd love to kind of turn to you and hear what needs to happen in this Race to Resilience. Um, as we also continue the race to zero in the lead up to COP uh, over the next six months. So over to you, Sheila. So thank you, Angela. And, uh, and yes, our situation is now worse with the fact that we are expecting the cyclone crisis to reemerge in, in Odisha and other places. Uh, I always get inspired when I hear global, uh, you know, sort of strategies and uh, what you just said, sir, seems very inspiring. But a lot of it also depends upon 
so many choices in the culture of decision making that has to happen at local and national levels and with global private sector institutions because there are certain areas in which there are quick wins and there are certain areas where there aren't quick wins so how do you deal with both these because they're not all going to go at the same pace so my constituency really is the people who live informally across the world so about a couple of billion people who presently don't have access to water and sanitation use wood and other biofuel materials that destroy their lungs and face evictions and in this covid period are devastated with terrible livelihoods Uh, government institutions don't have mechanisms to deal with them and global institutions including those like the world economic forum just do not acknowledge this volume of un unserviced communities uh, whose well-being is as much a part of the race to resilience uh, the climate justice elements of uh, the paris agreement and our general commitment to produce democratized equitable resources to everybody so for me the real challenge now is how do we how, how do we create a culture of inclusion so when you talk about energy today there's a terrific potential because two thirds of this billion and a half people have no energy or they are stealing energy and creating fires in their neighborhoods how can the alternate energy system produce facilities and services for them at scale so that they don't end up just using more conventionally provided energy how are we going to produce new forms of livelihoods that are carbon neutral for them you know there are lots of these very very local but and when you aggregate them seriously global situations and when you talk about disasters you find that you cannot future proof them without providing them minimum amenities so i feel that in this conversation and we we have to bring in this bottom 30% of urban and rural vulnerable communities who are being presently just rhetorically included in conversations but are not structurally part of any solution and there is an assumption that they are just beneficiaries so i think we need to change this conversation whether it's in the world economic forum or it's in the race to resilience or it's in climate change or it's in sdgs so i'd like all of you who are going to speak about this to give us ideas inspirations potentials for partnerships so that these communities these women who are looking after their communities and dealing with leaky bucket investments start having new solutions that both the governments and private sector globally and nationally can provide to them thank you sheila these are incredibly important words and and maybe just um to take it a little bit further of course these are you know all of what we're talking about today is is a huge and urgent challenge if you think about the next 6 months to cop how how can you help us you've been working for a long time with communities to to bring this resilience um and to to work closely on the issues that you outlined how can you how do we bring this to the fore as you suggested what would be maybe your one key action for us um to be able to to drive this over the next 6 months to cop 26 there are no silver bullets in dealing with poverty of course so just like you have a plan to go from now to 2030 and 2050 we have to create solid solid milestones that go there so the things we are doing right now is we are producing critical campaigns that matter to poor women uh and we're saying how can we create new partnerships with national city level national and global institutions covid has destroyed the nutritional status of all young people below the age of 15 who in many of our cities have not eaten greens for 6 to 8 months we have homes 
in 50% or 80% of the places where the roofs fly off, they leak, they burn. We need new materials that are affordable to communities without subsidies for being resilient to the climate distortions that are happening. We're looking at international aid and assistance. We're looking at national budgets. And we're asking why that money is not being utilized. We know that billions of dollars are supposed to be allocated. But even the money that's there is not being utilized. Not even 35% of the Green Climate Fund's money till two years ago was actually dispersed. This is shocking. Mm -hmm. So my point is, it's one thing to calculate the money that you need. The other thing is to create proper, very robust mechanisms so that they reach the places you want them to reach. They give resources to the people who need them. And you can measure the impact of that. So those are the kind of things that I am bringing uh, into the adaptation uh, issues of climate change, to the race to resilience, and to all the institutional arrangements that are working on issues of cities. Plus, I'm trying to see whether networks of social movements, you know, social movements come up when everybody ignores you, then you create large aggregations to knock on everybody's doors. So there are social movements right from indigenous people to the urban poor. And we're saying, what role, voice, and agency can they bring to this conversation so that organized representatives of these underserved communities start working with leaders of industry and leaders of government and policymaking agencies to produce new ways of working? Thank so you. I hope to work with all you guys. Thank you. Thank you, Sheila. Absolutely. And, and we certainly look forward to working closely with you on this journey as well. Um, and, and the point that you make is also critical. It's one thing to make commitments and pledges. It's another to deliver on them and actually to kind of see implementation through. And, and that's where, let's say, the hard work really begins in a sense. Um, and it is a journey and it will take, obviously, um, a big collaboration to get there. Um, and so with that, actually, let me let me turn over as well now to Jesper, Jesper Broden, the CEO of Inca Group and IKEA on, on a little bit of a similar theme here, um, right? So IKEA has set a goal to become climate positive by 2030. Um, you've also acted as co-chair of the CEO Climate Leaders hosted by the World Economic Forum, which is indeed about pushing companies to set bold Paris aligned commitments. Now, I think on this theme of commitments versus, let's say, short term reality, this is where we're at. It's one thing to set bold 2050 commitments. This is, let's say, a minimum expectation these days. It's another to translate that into a very specific short term investment plan and business plan to really demonstrate that the move is happening in terms of achieving those commitments. Mm. Can you, can you talk to us a little bit about that um, in the context of, of business? Um, what's happening with the leaders in this space and, and what more do we need to push, again, to translate these commitments into that really near-term action and solution set? Thank, thank you so much. And thank you, um, Antonia for, and Wes uh, for uh, inviting us and uh, being a, such an excellent host. Um, in a time when the world needs to come together more than ever before. Um, um, I believe um, we, listening to you, all of you previous speakers, I think we all can recognize that we have entered uh, what is probably the most important decade in the history of humankind. Uh, we stand before an ex we stand in an existentialistic crisis that will impact every person, um, uh, every business, and uh, acknowledging that, um, of course, uh, uh, leads to um, a lot of uh, despair, a lot of fear. But what we are after is more what type of actions and leadership that we need to um, uh, put in front, uh, because there is an opportunity for us to resolve the situation, and we will. Now, uh, just to say, from a business perspective, and I think a lot of business leaders out there would agree with me, there are several reasons, each one of them strong enough for us uh, to lean into this topic. Uh, to start with, with the knowledge that we have right now, of course, we can't 
allow ourselves uh, to pass on to future generations. Um, so as much as the world needs a, a time horizon up to 2050 to deliver all the way, we need to break our break down our goals to make sure that they are in the 2025 and 2030 perspective. Um, we also see from a business perspective uh, a rapid development where consumers, customers, but also talents out there that we want to attract to our companies they are demanding of us as brands and big companies to be a leader. And they, they start to make their choices more and more visible. Um, finally, which is one of the most important things, um, even if there are dilemmas to be cracked, even if there are timings, even if there are major investments and even a lack of innovation in certain uh, areas, this is the new economy. This is not charity. This is not uh, adverse to making business. On the contrary, um, we see uh, evidence after evidence that being climate smart equals being resource smart and equals being cost smart. And here I need all of us to believe in that. And we need all of us to join that moment because making it adverse to business or jobs or economy will uh, only slow down the process. And it's also definitely wrong, I believe. Now, turning to the Climate Alliance, it's, um, it's an inspiring group. Of course, I say that I'm a co-chair of the group, but uh, I must say I, it's a, a joy for me to be part of that uh, movement. Uh, it is an active movement. We are leaning forward. Um, the entry ticket to, to be part of it um, is uh, in short to be committing to Paris, uh, to the 1.5 uh, targets and such, and the commitment to be part of uh, disclosures uh, going forward as well. But the point goes beyond that. We are right now active in sharing climate plans in between us. Um, so the agenda is tilting towards action and what type of actions we can do uh, as individual companies, but also as um, branches or parts of uh, industries. Um, and then uh, even more so building up to, as we've been speaking to the uh, excellent opportunity of COP26 and everything that happens before, uh, an opportunity for us to mobilize around uh, incredibly important topics when it comes to infrastructure changes of uh, energy, mobility, consumption and more. Uh, because it mean, in this case, uh, actually, almost any company, any government is too small in itself to, to uh, resolve all of this. So collaboration um, and helping each other leaning forward is what the WEF uh, CEO Climate Alliance uh, is all about. Thank you, Jesper. And as you mentioned, I mean, obviously a group of leaders um, pushing this agenda. And as Alok highlighted, there's sort of over 2,000 companies that have equally joined the race to zero. Um, we need leaders, obviously, to kind of push the agenda. I think just a quick question on, on I think, everybody's mind is how do we move the rest uh, of the business community and, and draw more leadership on this agenda, which is really what we also need to shift the entire sector as a, as a whole. Mm. Any kind of quick thoughts on what we can do, what you're doing, what others are doing over the next six months to kind of continue to push that mm -hmm. more broadly? Well, I would say, first of all, my recommendation to everybody out there is with all the facts we have now, we need to take a bit of a leap of faith. I don't think any business that I know of size has all the answers. Um, several businesses do have a lot of answers already and proof points, um, but we, it requires a bit of leap of faith here uh, for us to get moving. moving uh, and sometimes leading businesses, we want um, to have all the details in the plan before we commit ourselves. And in this case, we need to, to probably take a, a slightly different approach, um, um, at least partly. And then I think uh, it's time for the world, and I also see that happening, to move from debating whether climate change is an issue uh, those who want to have those debates, <laughs> I think they, they can have that, but uh, the rest of us need to uh, focus our energy into the actions. Um, because in the end of the day, it's only the actions that will move us. Um, and here I'm, uh, I'm uh, known to my colleagues to be a bit of an optimist, but I have a lot of proof points to, to also uh, show that optimism is uh, in its place here. If I take examples from IKEA only uh, relating to previous speakers, we have invested, we have shifted assets in the companies and we've invested more in more renewable energy than we consume totally in the company. And we have now gone from two and a half to actually adding four billion euro to that portfolio. We're part of a system with a foundation which has recently announced adding one billion in development plans for climate uh, topics, which would not, which would be typically in developing markets uh, as well. Um, we are on the move to uh, uh, make sure that all of our home deliveries will be electric vehicles by 2025. 
Uh, and I can mention a lot of things because uh, th this is not about the silver bullet. It's a jigsaw puzzle to address your climate uh, uh, footprint in its totality. Now, we have a couple of headaches. We have a couple of unresolved matters and some worries. But um, the majority of things is proof points that we are growing as a company. We are profitable. We have been growing with more than 13% since we started this climate plan in 2016. And we have reduced the absolute climate footprint, the CO2 footprint, with 14%. So if anybody says it's not possible to be a good business and do good business, I would argue it soon will probably be the opposite. Now, my final, uh, so to say, wish and advice is this can happen through... Uh, uh, friction, conflict, uh, uh, it can happen to, through tough legislative measures and um, enforcements, and um, all of that might also be part of what is needed going forward. But I think it's uh, up to all of us leaders, business leaders uh, and leaders and representatives like Alok and others to actually find new ways of respecting each other and creating dialogue around how we make incentivizing investments into the future that we want to see. And I'm optimistic that that can happen. Thank you. Thank you, Jesper. I think both for your leadership in this agenda, but also the pragmatism that you bring to it. Um, it is about kind of making that plan and, and moving it forward. Um, you also kind of mentioned some of the, the broader areas here in terms of companies sort of moving this agenda or perhaps also being moved by this agenda. So let me turn to Fike. So Fike, you're, of course, former CEO of DSM. You now sit on the boards of Philips and Unilever. We're equally instrumental in setting up the CEO uh, Climate Leaders Group. Um, the role of boards, uh, shareholders, of course, in the context of driving climate is critical and is increasingly so as well. Um, I just wanted to kind of hear from you, what do you see as the priorities over the next six months? Again, kind of bringing us back to, we have six months to COP26. Where do we really need to be laser sharp in our focus to move this agenda forward? Yeah, thank you. And thanks for being in this uh, distinguished panel. Very good. Um, and um, what I think what we need to do in the next six months to watch the COP, is raise our voice as companies, raise our voice as governance uh, towards a successful COP. And, and we as companies would like to raise our voice also to stimulate governance to take stronger actions, to be honest. Because we are six years <coughs> down the road from Paris and we are not on track. We are derailing already in the first six years. And this was a roadmap for 30 or 50 years but already in six years we are derailing. Uh, we cannot be proud uh, on that. So we need to raise the bar, we need to get back on track. Uh, what is back on track for companies uh, to really commit uh, to net zero in 2050? That's one. Secondly, not only 2050, because that's far away, but a clear roadmap of step-by-step -step reduction till that moment from now on. Um, that means intermediate targets for 2025, for 2030, 2040, etc., towards that end goal by 2050. Being totally transparent on our emissions, on the financial impact of climate-related matters, so that also investors and society can follow us, and of course embracing all kinds of um, of, of uh, carbon low carbon policies like carbon pricing, putting an internal price of carbon. DSM just raised its internal carbon price from 50 to 100 euros per ton. Um, it's amazing to be to see that the European ETS system uh, carbon price increased in the last whatever period. Um, uh, first one it was installed a decade ago from 20 to five, then a couple of years ago, start rising to 20, 25, and now already uh, in the 50s. So uh, it is an important tool. And I think it's not only important for companies, it is not only important uh, for the governments, but also for investors. And you see uh, what happened yesterday with, with uh, the case in the Netherlands around Shell, uh, but you see it also in boards. Uh, this topic should be higher, higher on the agenda. And so, Thanks, Fike. I mean, maybe just just picking up on that that last point. Of course, um, you mentioned some of the the recent activities that have happened, but also 
let's take the case of Unilever, right? So that's a case where there was a sort of proactive move to bring to shareholders uh, a climate plan, an ambitious yeah. climate plan, which was overwhelmingly supported. So there's a sort of proactive push out, um, as well as in some quarters, a reactive push in. Do you see this as something that's going to, to expand um, over, over the next year or so? And, and what kind of uh, you know, let's say support. Can we can we put behind this as well? Well, I think that uh, <laughs> uh, many. I was 13 years CEO. To be honest, when I spoke with investors, they all talked about the results and the EBITDA and the EBITDA next year, etc. And then at the end of of my roadshow, maybe an intern asked a question about ESG. And the big bosses were listening to the intern. Oh, yeah, good question. And let them answer. Okay, good. This whole ESG and the E of ESG, the environmental, but also the governance on it, will become more and more important. It is not on the side uh, anymore for investors. And it's interesting to see Unilever had the guts to put its whole climate policy of Unilever, uh, which is uh, on mitigation, on adaptation, quite a progressive policy for an advisory vote for its shareholders. Asking to shareholders, well, you know our company, uh, you know what we do. What is your opinion uh, on that? Do you fully support it? And we had a massive, overwhelming uh, support of the shareholders, uh, 90, it was over 95 and 99, I believe even, uh, support of, 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 of the shareholders. So really, uh, really great. Meaning basically that the shareholders say, well, we are investors in Unilever, and what the Unilever does with climate approach, we totally support and agree. And that's an important signal, which we have not seen in the past, that shareholders and investors are being so clear in what they want. Out of their moral responsibility, out of their societal responsibility, but I believe also out of their financial responsibility, because they don't want to sit later on with pension money on stranded assets, and they want companies to stimulate, uh, to remain active and to remain, let's say, future-proof. Uh, and that is basically what companies do who address this issue. They are future-proofing themselves. Um, so I think that the world is really, really changing. I mean, there was a good moment to change and there is a second good moment to change. And we are now on the second best moment to change today. The best moment was yesterday, but the second best moment is today. Absolutely. Thank you, Fika. And, and I think indeed this sort of new generation of in investors is certainly rising and playing that active role that you described. Let me just turn um, for a moment to a few questions actually that have come in uh, through, our, through our chat here. One, one that actually comes back to you, uh, Sheila, around some of the points that you made in terms of this, let's say, gap between commitments and, and distribution of funds. Um, which voices need to, to make that push, uh, basically, over the next six months? Which voices need to kind of come to the table and, and be able to, to help translate those commitments into uh, investments in, in reality? Well, thank you for this question. It's one of my most favorite ones to answer. You know, I think that this has to be across the board. Uh, say if you are getting money from your municipality and that money is not utilized, although it is allocated to address the challenges of water and sanitation of informal settlements, it's a national subsidy or a national allocation. Uh, if it is a bilateral or a multilateral institution's loan or grant the country, and that's not used. I think that that has to be seen as a collective global responsibility, as well as a very, very important governance issue for local communities themselves. Uh, I have discovered that from actually analyzing budgets of local governments, of national government departments, of bilateral and multilateral agencies in terms of what was the allocation in the budget, what was the uh, money that was given out, and then what was actually utilized. And it is shocking. And, the, and you know, uh, 
while if this was in any other sector, it would have been quickly picked up and dealt with and some course correction would have been done. But here, it's a standard procedure in many government institutions to just roll it into the next year. So the allocations just get lesser and lesser. So I think that while on one hand, there has to be adequate allocation, execution, and impact assessment, you have to keep your finger on this thing. And uh, uh, a think tank called IID in the UK has done a whole research called Money Where It Matters. Uh, you can go on the net and look for it. And it's looked at global resources allocated for adaptation on climate change, right from the Green Climate Fund to others, and looking at what can be done. And based on that, a group of us from different local, national to global institutions have produced new principles for financing adaptation. These are also available on the net. But the whole idea is that as citizens, you know, we are all now global citizens. The child who lives in an informal settlement in any of the countries we work is today a global citizen. They check things that are happening around the world. So we all can actually keep an eye on that. And just as Panke said that shareholders are changing, you know, Populations are also changing. They're changing, and we have to give them instruments by which they can gauge whether what needs to happen is happening and what to do. Because right now, somehow, globally, the only way you can show your distrust or your anger is by destroying public assets, which means there's a serious lack of governance there. So we need to change these larger processes, bring more transparency, bring more problem solving, ongoing monitoring to bring this change. It's not going to come just naturally because we want it. We have to work for it, I think. Thank you, Sheila. Yeah, I mean, it comes, it does continue to come back to, I think, the points that you made up front is, is an entire citizen and community mobilization around the solutions, obviously, to uh, tackling climate change. As, as much as, of course, in COP26, we bring the leaders together to talk and, and walk the halls of a negotiation, that is a critical moment, but it is really on the ground that, that these impacts, but also the solutions um, are both being felt and, and also will come. Um, I think with you know, just a few minutes left in this discussion, I mean, we, we've obviously covered quite a broad range of issues here, and I think it's just really a signal to the reality of, of tackling climate change. We need many solutions coming from many quarters to actually move action forward here, right? So starting with FATI in terms of the energy transition, of course, cooperation, deployment of existing technologies, investment in new technologies, but also, let's say, stopping and halting investment in the solutions that are not part of our, our climate Future. So there's some key 400 <laughs> actions, as he highlighted, that need to move forward there. It's a pretty, uh, a pretty comprehensive approach on one hand. Um, but also, as, as you noted, um, Sheila, as well, really, this is a true mobilization effort. Um, and, and we need to kind of do this jointly and in partnership, of course, around the world as well. Um, companies are leading, as Jesper said, and, and we do, of course, um, continue to push uh, climate aligned targets, but also near-term pathways um, really now over the next six months to drive investments in the right place. Um, but also, Fike, as you said, there is a movement. There's a mobilization happening from shareholders, from boards, um, kind of in one direction out, but also coming in that, that I don't think is going to slow. This is going to keep ramping up um, over the next, uh, well, six months to year, and, and we'll see this kind of continue to, to drive. So in a sense, that's really just the tip of the iceberg in a way of, of some of the areas that we know we need to push forward over the next few months. And we, of course, have a series of conversations today to dive a little bit deeper into these issues, looking, as we mentioned, at some of these key sectors, hard to abate, which are critical. The role of nature, as I flagged at the beginning, is a core part of the solution um, as well, um, but equally um, all of the other issues that we discussed here. I think just to kind of leave our viewers and our panelists to follow with 
kind of a, a vote of action or a, a word of confidence? What, what exactly, what is sort of the action, one or two things that you would point us towards over the next six months in the lead up to COP? Um, would love to just wrap this up with a closing reflection. Um, maybe, Fike, if I can turn to you to start, would love your thoughts on that. Appreciate it. Uh, yeah, um, uh, the first thing is uh, we didn't see COVID coming. We do see the climate crisis coming. Uh, so if at once this has a bigger impact on Bangladesh, on uh, Ethiopia, etc., we get refugees, we get people upset, annoyed, angry, uh, in disarray or whatever, we cannot say, oh, where's this coming from? We saw this already for years and we were not on track. So the first thing is be on track in pairs, responsibility for governments. In the next half year, step up companies, reduce your emissions, commit to 2025, to, to zero 2050, uh, a roadmap to that, embrace carbon pricing. But also on the investor side, uh, to make a clear framework, IFRS, hopefully can the foundation can help there to uh, navigate uh, what is really green, what is green, uh, that boards take it in in, 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 in their possession. I, we, we did uh, a couple of years ago a survey on the big companies and said, for who is climate change important? 100%. Who of you discuss this on a regular basis in your boards? 30%. Uh, hey, give me a break. Uh, we can improve here. So, those kinds of things governments, companies, investors can do in the coming period. And I think it's important. And if we put those things at the table, at the COP, then hopefully we cannot walk away at the COP anymore without a clear agreement. Great. Thank you. If I can, Sheila, if I can turn to you, your closing reflections. I'm so glad you brought in the, the issues of COVID because this really tells us the kind of global unanticipated crisis that we have to build our collective ability to address. And what we have realized is that our politics, our global, national, local politics is not in place. Governance systems are not in place. Uh, uh, administrative procedures are not in place. And we were all caught very messed up and most communities are feeling that they have been abandoned in this crisis. So I think that it's a very important point for us to use this situation and the frailties that it shows us to ramp up what we need to do and to do it in ways that's good for us and it's good for the climate. But just like you said, Frank, that you need to educate and help people understand. I think globally we need to understand. I have this uh, uh, imagery of saying we should we should have a thing called Climate 101. You have a discourse that is with scientists that local people don't understand. Mm -hmm. We have science taught in school and colleges that has nothing to do with climate science. So how do we create a climate lens that looks at everything we do through that lens so that we make choices that are important for five years and 10 years from now. So I think that for me is the urgent thing. And if we can begin that systematically, then the choices that people will make and the culture that people will have, which right now, he's, thank you, you see it in your board and in your shareholders, becomes a general population response. So I look forward for that too. Great. Thank you, Sheila. Thank you, Faike, also Fati and Jesper for kicking us off really in this discussion. I think one of, of hopefully many where we continue to kind of push this agenda over the next six months and beyond, of course. So with that, we'll, we'll close this discussion. Also encourage our viewers to tune in to the sessions to follow where again we go deeper into some of these solution areas and we hope and look forward to really working with many of you in this mobilization and push to COP26 because really we have a lot of work to get done. So thank you again.